Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Testament Survey. Today, we're going to study on the last book, the book of Revelations, which is also known as the book of last things or the book of worship. So even before we could study, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Anyone? Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day, the new day you have given us, Lord. Lord, as we are going to learn about the book of Revelation, Lord, Lord, the prophecies which are there, Lord, it is going, it is still being fulfilled, O oh Lord. Lord, we as we are going to learn from your true and living word, Lord, Lord, minister to us, Lord. Whatever Pastor Diana will be teaching to us, Lord, it should not be just a teaching, but Lord, it should implement and it should be visible in our daily life, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. So let's all of us turn to the book of Revelations in our Bible. And also if some of us have the PDF version of our notes, you can turn to. But most of it, we're going to study from the Bible so that um, I would prefer you all to open your Bible, keep it ready so that we can read few scriptures. And also, because it's just a survey, we won't be going in detail, but do not be discouraged in the final year. Revelation is one of our main subject where we would be studying in detail, in detail so that, you know, you don't have to worry every prophecy, every detail in the book of Revelations. And we will be having a compare study the book of Daniel and the book of Revelations together. That would be your final year subject. So right now we are just going as a survey. The a few things that are very important, the highlight of this book is what we will try to cover in one hour. Though there are lots, I'll try to do my best to cover in 15 minutes of the time that has been uh, allotted for this book. Okay. So keep a note as we study, um, have a notepad, pen, so that, you know, we can make note of certain things that are important that us, uh, that would help us to understand the book of Revelations. Well, uh, the book of Revelation is the book that is surrounded with great deal of controversy or mystery or integrity. So it is a mysterious because it is a book with an extensive amount of symbolic language. It is. And we also see that uh, it, it reveals the futuristic in nature. This book is, uh, it also interprets, uh, the interpretation of this book depends on a great deal on overall of the eschatology. So what do we know about the background of the book of Revelation? Well, the author of this book is... John, the son of Zebedee, who was the author of the Gospel of John. And he was also with Jesus in the inner three people in the inner circle. Who's the three people in the inner circle? Who are the three people? Peter, James, and John. Yes, Peter, James, his brother, and sorry, Peter, James, and John are the two brothers, the sons of thunders, where the three people always with Jesus and they were called as the three in a circle. And he was the author. John was the author of this book. Even though the style of this book is quite different from the Gospel of John. But then one thing we need to understand that it is a vision shared by the Lord himself. So it, the words are prophetically received from the Lord. So that Maybe one of the reasons why the style of writing, the words, the nature, the content may be little or slightly different from John's gospel. Well, the occasion of this book, we see that uh, John was in exile on the island of Patmos when he received this vision. How do we know? We see that in the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verse 9. I won't be reading much of the verses because there's a lot of information to be covered in this class. So what we see here is he says, I, John, I'll read it. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we also see Patmos was a small island of, uh, you know, uh, of that coast of Asia Minor in the Aegean Sea. So it was formed by an 
eruption of a volcanic and it was about 60 miles southwest of Ephesus. And it was a small, barren, mountainous island where it was only six miles wide and 10 miles in long. And the date of writing is about 90 to 95 AD when uh, John was in exile under the reign of Domitian. So the book would have been written during this time. And most scholars place that John's writing was near the end of Domitian's rule. And the name of the book is called as Revelations because it represents the revelation that John received in the vision from the Lord. And this, there is a very strong emphasis in this book on what John saw. That is almost in every chapter he begins with, I saw. He expresses, he expresses his writing saying, this is what I saw. So the book can be called as revelation because it reveals the ascended son of God as how he functions as a great high priest. So the word for the revelation or uh, the apocalypse means unveiling, unveiling of something. Something that is unveiled is now brought into light or focus for our understanding. So the book of Revelation is an unveiling of Jesus Christ, that he is truly and uh, and in the present tense, like where he is, he is right now seated at the right hand of God. So the book of Revelation begins with the vision of the Lord Jesus as it is exalted and glorified in state. So in this book of Revelation, we also see Jesus in four different forms. First form, just make a note, please. We see that, um, can I request one of us to turn to uh, Revelations chapter 1, verse 9? If we can be very quick, we can try to complete as much as possible. Uh, first point, just make a note, Revelations 1, 9, somebody turn to. Second point is from Revelations chapter 4, verse 1. And third point, Revelation 17, chapter, sorry, Revelation 17, verse 1. Fourth point, Revelations chapter 21, verse 9. So if four of y'all, if y'all have taken it, can we go with the first Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, please? Revelation chapter 1 and verses 9. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that ours, that us in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Thank you. So what we see here, we also see in, uh, in uh, chapter 3, verse 22. Okay, where it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we see that the great high priest is ministering among the churches. So this image of Christ presents him as the head of the church, as our great high priest. The first point is Jesus been represented as the great high priest, as the head of the church. Now the second point, can I request one of us to turn to chapter 4 verse 1? Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Amen. We also see in same book, we see that Jesus Secondly, after the great high priest, he's been represented as the Lamb of God. Lamb of God who provided for our salvation. So he is the one who is worthy. He is the one who opened the seals. And he is the one who offers up incense for his people. Further down when we read chapter 16, verse 21, we see that. 
So first one was the great high priest who was the head of the church. And second was Jesus represented as the, as the Lamb of God who's provided for our salvation. And he is worthy to open the seals. And also we see that he is, he is the one who offers up incense for his people. That is, intercedes for his people. So with that, we will move on to the third point. Okay, just remember all these points. Third point, chapter 17, verse 1. Chapter 17, verse 1. If you are ready, please go ahead. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. One of the seven angels who had seven boots came and said to me, I will show you the punishment of great prostitute who sits on many waters. So here, it calls us harlot. Harlot is who? Who does it represent in the book of Revelations? Okay, we'll come to it later. We're studying about Jesus right now. I'll come to that point later. So here we see Jesus has been represented we also see in chapter 21 verse 8 okay both 17 verse 1 and 21 uh, chapter 21 verse 8 we see that jesus has been revealed as the king of kings and the lord of lords who conquers over all so what does it mean he is the one who comes riding on a white horse to execute judgment so the first one what did we see Jesus as? The first point? Anyone? First point. High priest. Jesus as the great high priest. Second one, we see Jesus as? Anyone from this class? We saw Jesus as the Lamb of God who provided for us as our salvation. Third point, we see as? Jesus has the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, said. Thank you. Okay, please remember these three points. Okay, now the fourth point, Revelations chapter 21, verse 9. Revelation chapter 21 and verses 9. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of seven large plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you bride the wife of the lamb thank you we also read in uh, chapter 22 verse 20 says he who testifies to these things says surely i'm coming quickly amen even so come lord jesus so what we see here we see jesus the fourth point so jesus has been represented as the bridegroom who's ready to receive his bride so the fourth point is, we see Jesus as the bridegroom who's ready to receive his bride. So now, can we emphasize on the four points that we covered? What are the four representation of Jesus in the book of Revelations? First point, anyone from the class? Jesus, the high priest. Jesus, the high priest. Okay, second point. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Lamb of Thank you. Third point. Jesus is the King of Kings. Yes. Third point, Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Fourth point. The room. Yes. Okay, the first point, the great high priest who's ministering among the churches. Second point, the Lamb of God who's provided for our salvation. Third point, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and who conquers over all. Fourth point we see is the bridegroom who's ready to receive his bride. See, these are the four representations of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And then we move on to the purpose of the writing of this book. So John makes it very clear the reason why he is writing. And yes, we see that the purpose was Christ was the main purpose. So John's purpose is uh, that the revelation is coming primarily 
uh, from the Christ himself. It's not like John's purpose, but Christ's purpose of him writing this letter. Because we see that Christ is revealing himself through John. And John is writing, this is what I saw. So the revelation is completely Jesus. Jesus is writing. So the purpose is not of John, but Christ. So we see that uh, one of the purposes is to respond in obedience to the Lord who commanded him to write. So John's obedience to the Lord and he writes this letter. And the second point we see is the purpose to give believers a look into the future and to encourage us regarding the ultimate triumph of the church. And we also see the third purpose is specifically for the churches in the Asia Minor to both the seven churches that this letter has been addressed to, to both like condemning them and he's also addressing the concern. And here we also see, yes, Revelation being the last book in our Bible, we all uh, it can be compared with the first book of Genesis. So there's some comparison that we have listed here. I would like to share it with the class. So the book of Revelation is the book of symbols as we uh, heard in the introduction. It is the book of symbols, symbols that can be interpreted by the rest of the biblical record. So for us to understand the book of Revelation, it is it is important for us to prepare ourselves by studying the rest of the Bible first. So in the book of Revelation, we see an unique relationship between the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. And the book of Revelation represents the full fruit, which was the seed. So let's see the comparison. I've just put it on a PowerPoint for us to understand. Give me a minute while I project that. Let me share that to window to you so that we can study together. Okay, here's the unique relationship with the book of Genesis. Everyone can see this page? Can everyone see this page? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anita, for confirming. See, we see Genesis and we are facing Revelation. So we see the first one, the first heaven and the first earth. And in the Revelation, we see new heaven and the new earth. And in Genesis, we see the sun and moon were created in chapter 1, Genesis. And in the book of Revelations, we see there is no need for sun or moon because we are having the Lord himself with us. His brightness is enough for us to indwell in his presence. Here we see the first Adam and his bride. And in the book of Revelations, we see the last Adam, Jesus, and his bride, the church. In the book of Genesis, we see the river passes through the garden. But here we see the river proceeds from the throne of God to us. In the book of Genesis, we also see Satan makes his first appearance. And in the book of Revelation, we see Satan makes his final exit. I'm not getting, getting into detail explanation. There is a detail explanation, but it will take the whole class if I start explaining and explaining the comparison of these two points. But yes, we will be studying in detail in your final year. So get excited and wait for that. Okay. So right now I'm just giving you the comparison overview. In detail explanation, we will study in the final year. Okay. Because there is in-depth explanation for both comparison okay and in the book of genesis we see the paradise defiled by sin and in the book of revelation we see defilement banned from the paradise of god and here we see in genesis the curse of sin is imposed 
And here we see the curse of sin is lifted. Genesis, the beginning of death, and Revelation is the end of death. There's no more death because we are in the presence of God. And in the book of Genesis, we see the sorrows and tears result from sin. And in Revelation, there's no more sorrow, no more tears because it's wiped away. We have the bride himself, bridegroom himself with us. Bride itself with us, sorry. And we have the redemption promised. And here we see the redemption is completed. In the book of Genesis, we see man been driven out from, driven from paradise. And here, here we see the restoration. The man has been restored back to paradise. And in the book of Genesis, we see that man denied access to the tree of life. And in the book of Revelation, we see that the access to the tree of life is restored back. So whatever was lost in the book of Genesis, we see the restoration being complete in the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, we see that is the capstone to the rest of the Bible record. Yes, it is the eternal purpose of God has been declared in the first two chapters from Genesis. And the eternal purpose of God is completed in the last two chapters of the book of Genesis. Sorry, the book of Revelation. It was started in the book of Genesis and it ended in the book of Revelation. It was completed in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. So with that, we will move on to the distinct features of the book of Revelation. So what are the, some of the distinct features of this book we see? First is the book of Revelation tops the list of the number of things like the use of the Old Testament reference and illusions. We see the book of Revelation, which does not specifically quote verses like Matthew or any of the other epistles, but it has more reference and allusions to the content of the Old Testament than any other book in the New Testament. So it has, it may have, uh, okay, the scholars say that it may have about 400 allusions or direct reference to the Old Testament. And this is much higher than uh, any closest book which can co cover over 100 such references. And so they are comparing this with Hebrew. Even Hebrew has certain references to the Old Testament, but then it tops it. Revelation tops it by having 400 references from the Old Testament. And this book, the book of Revelation, uses a lot of symbols. So depending how we count it, they may have, there have been suggestions that put the use of all the symbols up to 300. And the numbers, this book, the book of Revelation also uses the numbers like, the number numbers like 4, 10, 12. We, we also see like the triple six. Then there's 1,000. There's 1,44,000. Then there's some numbers like 10,000 times 10,000. And some of uh, one of the most prominent numbers that we see in the book of Revelations is the number seven. The number seven. So what is that? Can anyone recollect what are the seven? Uh, some of uh, the number seven has uh, been mentioned in the book of Revelation. Can you list something that you have heard or you have come across uh, when you have read the book of Revelation? Yes, Brother Isaac, you would like to share? <laughs> Okay, anyone from the class, what is the seven uh, in the book of Revelation talks about? There are many sevens, right? The author represents many sevens. Seven angels. Seven angels, yes. Anyone else? Uh, 
In the first three chapters, we see seven churches. Then we also see seven lampstands, seven stars, seven spirits. And then again, we see the talks about the seven seals. And then we see the seven trumpets released. And we see seven thunders, seven heads, seven uh, diadems. And yes, um, we also see seven bowels, seven mountains. Yeah, there's and things like this has been revealed of each seven. So, Brother Isaac, your mic is unmute, or you want to say something? Okay. So, in addition, the book of Revelation invokes seven blessings on the people of God. Seven blessings. I thought this, is, this would be very important, and I've mention them. Just give me a minute while I present that. Can you see the seven blessings? Yes. Can I request each one to take up those scripture verses so that we can read Revelations chapter 1 verse 3, Revelations 14, Chapter 14, verse 13, Revelation 16, verse 15. Each one, please take up those scriptures so that we can read out all these seven blessings over God's people. Revelations. Please go ahead, Sid. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. What is written in it? Because the time is near. Amen. Amen. Next. 14, 13. Next person, please turn to Revelations 14, verse 13. Revelation 14, verses 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven says, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor on their deeds will follow them. Okay, the next 16 verse 15. Okay, I'll read. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Next, anyone? 19, 9. 19, 9. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called the, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Amen. Next, chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such a second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Next, anyone else? 22nd verse 7. 20, 22nd and verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of prophecies in this book. Verse 14 from the same chapter. Verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Amen. So we see all the seven blessings in the scripture. First, we see the blessed are those who reap and keep the words of his prophecy. The second, we see blessed are those who die in the Lord. Third, we see, blessed are those who watch and keep themselves pure. Fourth, we see, blessed are those who are called on the marriage supper of the Lamb. Fifth point, we see that blessed are those who have a part in the first resurrection. Sixth, we see the blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy, who honor every word of this book. And keeps it. Seventh, blessed are those who do his commandments. Very important. 
Okay, let me stop presenting this. Let's go here. We also see the book of Revelation gives us a report card to the seven churches in Asia. So what is it? So these seven churches were located on the major Rome, Roman road. And if the person bearing the letter started at Ephesus and traveled north to Peragon, turning east to Titeria and continued toward the south, I think they would touch the churches in the exact order in which it is appearing in this book of Revelation. So let's see. So in the book of Revelations, let's turn to chapter 2. Okay, it talks about the seven churches. Here we see it's uh, talking about the first church in the Ephesians. It addresses to the angel of the church of Ephesians. If you see from chapter 2, verse 1 to 7, it talks about the positive about the church. It says, you're very hardworking, morally you're pure, you have a good doctrine. At the same time, negative. What is the negative report? It says, you have forsaken the first love. You have forsaken the first love. And what was the response? There is a response that has been demanding, demanded from this church. That is, repent. Remember, you need to repent and do as you once did. Get back to your first love. And if you do that, what is your reward? The reward to overcomers will be, will eat of the fruit of life. You will eat the fruit of life. That's in verse 7. So with that, we will move on to the church in Smyrna. That is from chapter 2, verse 8. 8 to 11, we see to the church of Smyrna. So the, uh, there is a positive report of this church where it says you're spiritually rich. Suffering for faith. You have suffered for faith. There's no much of negative report in this. But what is the response that has been demanded from this church is be faithful unto death. There is something that this church need to remember is to be faithful because there is a persecution, but then be faithful unto death. Okay, remember as we are studying, I was talking about... Uh, Uh, what was it we were talking about? Harlot, right? Yeah, before that, I, I wanted to share. Harlot here in the book of uh, Revelation, it denotes Rome. Okay, so yes, and um, they have been facing a lot of persecution from the Roman government. So here he's saying, yes, you have been suffering for faith, but then be faithful unto death. And if you are, if you keep up that promise, the reward for you will be the crown of life. Crown of life. We see that in verse 10. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Yeah. With that, we will move on to the next church. That is to the church of Paragmam. Chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. So to this church, God is saying, you are faithful in persecution. That's the positive of this church. Been faithful in persecution. It's the negative. What is the negative report of this church? They are faithful. But at the same time, they're compromising on certain things. They're indulgent in lifestyle. So we need to be very careful. Yes, this letter was written to all the seven churches, but we can also apply it to our own church, to our own self. Are we compromising in any area? Are we indulging in certain things that does not please God? And have a check over our own lifestyle. Ministry leaders, we need to check about our ministry, about our church, 
and about our own self. Let's have a check over ourselves. Yes, this letter was written to the seven churches in the Asia, but then it also it is applicable for each of us in today. And as God said to the church of Paragman, repent. If you're in any of these areas, repent. And when you repent, you see a reward. What is the reward? A white stone with a new name written on it. A white stone with a new name on it. In verse 17, we see that. I will, uh, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden mana to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on that stone, on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Look at the reward that we get when we repent and turn back to God. A God is a God who gives us the second chance. He never rejects us. He is a merciful God who is always forgiving, always loving. Again, we see the letter, I mean, he's uh, addressing the church of Thyatira, verse 18 till 29, chapter 2, verse 18 till 29. We see that giving a positive input on this church, saying that you are very loving, you're faithful, you are patient, good work. We see the fruit of the Spirit in this church. But then, the same time, I could also see something that is not pleasing God. What is that? Immorality. Teaching of Jezebel. There is a creeping of certain heresies in the church. These are something that displeases God. And here God is calling this church to repent. Hold fast that will that which you have to end. You need to put an end to certain things. Repent and come out of this. And if you repent and overcome all these, the reward for you will be power over the nations and the morning star. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. And with that, we will move on to the next church, Sardis. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. The church in Sardis, he writes to them. So he's looking at this church and he says, okay, the positive is trying to give some kind of positive report on this church, saying some are doing well. But at the same time, God is saying, this church is dead. This church is dead. Imagine that. He, he, he looks at the faith and he says, dead faith. You're wearing a garment that is defiled. And here there is a call. Repent and be watchful. Watch your path. Repent and be watchful. And if you repent and if you watch the path that you take, there is a reward. What is the reward? We see that you're clothed in white, named before angels. You're clothed in white, named before angels. Now with that, we'll move on to the sixth church. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 13. The Church of Philadelphia. He's looking at this church with, with a heart of gladness. He says, the church that is faithful. Church that is faithful. Faithful to God. And I don't see there's anything negative in this church. I think we all need to pray and ask God, God, help our ministry, help our church, help ourselves to be in this place, like how the church of Philadelphia was, was pleasing to God, who did the things that pleases him. They kept watch over themselves. 
that they may not give in to any kind of indulgence, any kind of immorality. They kept themselves faithful to God. It's not that they didn't face any persecution, but in spite of all, they were faithful to God. And here, God is asking this church, preserve, keep doing what you're doing. Preserve yourself. Good. But doesn't mean that you will be relaxed. You need to have a watch, more watch. Be careful what you're doing, what you're saying, how you're behaving. Have a, a check. Watchman, like, you know, you need to keep checking over yourself, or your ministry, over your church. Are we doing things right? You know, once in six months, have a review over yourself, the church, whatever programs we do, whatever ministry we are doing. Have a check, preserve, to preserve what we're doing and to excel ahead. So what is the reward you get when you have a watch over yourself and do well that is pleasing God? We are kept from the hour of trial and we have been made a pillar with a new name. With a new name. And with that, we are moving to the seventh church, which is that, verse 14 to 22. The church of Ludusia. There is no positive at all in this church. And he calls this church as lukewarm church. Where in the one of the Gospels we see that I don't want anyone to be lukewarm. I will spit you out. He says this church I see full of pride. There is spiritual nakedness in this church. Verse 16, it says, so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 17, because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and, I've and, I and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garment, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye slave, that you may see. 19. As many as I love, I rebuke, I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Your God is saying, because I love you, I'm bringing this rebuke and correction in you. I want you to repent. Be zealous on God. Check yourself. Come out of your pride. Come out of your spiritual nakedness. Humble yourself so that you will receive the reward. And what is the reward when they repent and humble themselves? What is the reward? We see the reward in verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. 22. He who has an ear, let him hear. That the Spirit says to the churches. So what we see here, sit on throne with Jesus. That would be the reward for each believer, each church, each ministry who takes, who checks over and watches and repents and overcomes from the sin or from the wicked ways or from the lukewarmness or from the pride or spiritual nakedness, whatever may be that we are in. If we repent and overcome those areas, and those things pleases God. And He's a God, been merciful, been forgiveness, who's ready to forgive. He restores us back to God. He restores us back to God and makes each of us, our ministry, our church, to be seated on the throne with Jesus. So each of us are seated on the throne with Jesus when we repent, when we turn to God. 
He's ready to forgive and restore us back to that first love. Restore us back to that relationship that we were intended to have with God. So it should be... Um, so these are some of the interpretation of the seven churches. And it's been, yes, in prophetic and condition of the churches during the church age. But we can also apply it for our own time according to the area that we may be going through. And we can change. We can overcome because that is the demand that has been placed on the churches. And when they repent, they also see the reward. So when we repent, we will also see the same reward to each of us in our ministry, in our church, in our individual, in our own life. Yes, we also see that the book of Revelation is the book of worship. We are to worship God and not worship the beast. We see that in chapter 9 on birds, 9, 13 or 9, 11 and 13, 14, 16. Some of these uh, chapters quotes about the worship of the beast. Here we see that God is interested in measuring the worshippers. How are we worshipping? God is asking us to worship with all our heart, mind and soul. Are we And strength, are we worshipping God in that way? So in Revelations, uh, you know, chapter 5, we see that then it... Uh, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. So there is a measure that has been taken note of those who worship there. We see in Revelations chapter 1 verse 17, John the apostle worshipped, <coughs> sorry, Worshipped at the feet of Jesus. Some of the things that we see talking about the worship. Revelations 1.17 where we say that we saw John worshipping Jesus at his feet. Revelations 5.11 to 12 we see that the angels of heaven worshipped at the throne. And same, same chapter 5. Verse 11 to 12, we also see the living creatures worshipped the lamp. The living creatures worshipping the lamp. And in chapter 4, verse 10 to 11, we see the 24 elders worshipping. Like they're putting down the crown, they're worshipping. And Verse four, chapter 14, verse 4, we see all nations shall worship before him. Due to time constraint, I'm not reading each scripture. But I'm just giving you the summary of each verse. We see that all nations have come to worship God before him. Chapter 5, verse 13. We see that every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, very important, just listen to this. What are they saying? Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Before that, we saw in uh, in in chapter four, where uh, the four living creatures having six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. And they are saying, "Holy, holy, holy, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come." See, the living creatures also have been worshiping the Lord, worshiping the Lord, the Lamb of God there. And here we see six point of every creature in heaven and on earth are worshipping God, saying blessing and honor and glory and power. Yes, that is how continuously there's worship before the throne of God. Angels are worshipping, living creatures are worshipping, people are worshipping, all nations are worshipping. And lastly, in verse 22, chapter 9, let me turn to 22. 
22, chapter 22, verse 9, it says, Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Listen. Those who keep the words of this book, what they do? They worship. So what we are supposed to do? We are supposed to worship God. So what do we see? The different types of worship. John worshipping Jesus at his feet. We see angels of the heaven worshipping at the throne. The living creatures worshipping the Lamb of God before the throne, crying out day and night, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And here we see the 24 elders worshipping God. They put down, put down the throne, oh, sorry, crown from their head and they worship God, prostrating. And all the nations are worshipping God before him. We also see that every creature is in heaven and on earth worshipping God. There's a very um, beautiful message by Louis Giglio. You see, he's projecting even the planets, they worship God. There's some kind of sound that they make, they worship God. And even uh, the mammals, like the dolphin, they worship God, they sing to God. And he's got some research he's done, and you know, uh, they, he, he, I'm not too sure, it's been very long back, I watched this video, this sermon by Louis Giglio, you can go on YouTube and see, um, yeah. Uh, it's a very beautiful message. I would encourage you all to check on that. Uh, if this had in my mind, I would have prepared and I would shared the link with you all. Um, or I will put it on the Google Classroom. You all can take a, a watch of this message. He says, even the cell, God had this plan, of course, even before the foundation of the earth. And, you know, it, it, some cell he researches and we, he says the mark of cross is there in that. And he also represents that everything the creator in the universe worshipping God and also the creatures like the mammals, the, uh, the fish and the sea, they sing to God. You know, the creation cries out to God. They sing, they worship him. And how much more you and I who have the wisdom of God, who have the sense, how much more we need to worship God because we are the created being. And we are created to worship him. And we need to worship him in chapter 22, verse 9. We need to worship God. So the book of Revelation leaves us with a great hope. What is it? We see that. We learn that the perfect, sinless, because there shall be no more curse. I would like to read Revelations chapter 22. Can I request one of us to read Revelations chapter 22, verse 3 to 5? This will be a last verse. I know we have exceeded our time. Just give me two minutes. We'll finish. Revelations chapter 22, verse 3 to 5, please. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What a hope. This book leaves us with a great hope that the perfect sinless lamb is Jesus and there shall be no more curse. There will be a perfect government that will come. The throne of God and the lamb shall be in it so that we don't need the sun or the moon. He is the lamb. The perfect service, a servant shall serve him. There is a perfect vision. They shall see his face. There's a perfect image. His name shall be on their foreheads. There's a perfect 
illumination. Why? Because the Lord God gives them light. And there's a perfect hereafter because they shall reign with Him forever and ever. This is the greatest hope that we have when we read the book of Revelation. And it is a very beautiful book that we can understand only by the grace of God. That as we read, He will reveal it to us. The Holy Spirit who is within us will teach us, will give us the understanding as we read. So with that, I'll end this book and open to the class. If there's anything that you would like, you would like to add, share, please go ahead. And we will take time to pray and end this book with a word of prayer. Yeah, I would like to share on, let's reflect over ourselves, just like how Jesus had to the seven churches. And he brings a correction in them because he loves them. Because he loves them, is bringing correction in them. The same way God loves each of us. And the ministries, the churches are not own, not ours. It has been given by God. Everything belongs to him. So he wants to see it been perfect. Okay, so because God loves us, he tries to correct us. He tries to chastise us. So let's be open for God to correct us. If we are in that place, allowing God to correct us, that means we are in the place of safety. Allowing God to correct us, allowing God to change us, allowing God to be more like Him. Yes, it is a process because we are not the perfect, but then we need to come to a place where we humble ourselves and say, Lord, have a watch change my heart just like how even David prayed look at my heart and cleanse me make it new make me more like you so each of us need to come to a place where we submit ourselves just like how the 24 elders humble themselves remove their crown we need to do that as a leader of the ministry of the church humble ourselves to the presence of God, allow Him to correct, change, chastise, and help us to repent and overcome so that we can receive the reward from God. So today, as we study the book of Revelations, yes, we need to allow God to correct us so that we can repent, so that we can change and be in a place to receive His reward. And as we receive His reward, we also have great hope that is, this book gives us, that we would be with God. We will be seated in Christ at the right hand of God. And we don't, uh, we don't need anything else because God himself is going to be a light, a salvation, a protector, a provider, where we can see him face to face. The book of Revelation says those who are pure at heart can see God face to face where we can see his name shall be written on our forehead. And there are no more curse, no more weeping, there, more, there is no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there is no more death, there's only life eternal in him. Okay, and it is a promise that God is giving to us, given to us, and we receive it in Jesus. So with that, I end this session. If there's anything that you would like to share, Please feel free. If not, we can get into a time of prayer. Okay. Okay. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for every opportunity that you gave me and each of us, Lord. We may not be worthy, Lord, but you, by your grace, you chose to use each one of us, Lord. Father, we come into your presence with art of thanks and praise. We submit ourselves just as we are. With our own weakness, with our own brokenness, we come before you. Lord, we are thankful to you that you fill us with your word, with your revelation, with your understanding. And as you promised your servants, Lord, 
that you will use us in spite of our weakness, in spite of our challenges, in spite of all our brokenness, Lord. No matter how we are, Lord, you are faithful. The God who lives in each one of us are faithful. You will minister to us and to others, Lord. You are the God who will put your word into us and you will speak to each of us, Lord, in the way that we could understand, O oh Father. Lord, I thank you that you were faithful enough in me, that you gave me the strength to take this class from the book of Genesis to Revelation, Lord. You enabled me to interpret, to teach, to reveal what you want to reveal to them. Thank you, Father. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Lord, that you spoke in and through me. Thank you, Lord, that you were exalted in each and every book, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, O oh Father. Even as we come towards the end of this book, Lord, our journey with you is not over, Lord. We journey together, O oh Father. We'll journey together with you that the Holy Spirit who is within us will minister to us, Lord. Will continue to minister to us and continue to teach us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you are the faithful God. You are the God who puts that passion, that fire within us. Gives us the zeal to know more about you, Lord. Even when we are dry, when we are far, Lord. When we are fallen, you never give up on us. I see that you have walked in me. You have uplifted me. You have strengthened me, Lord. In all my weaknesses, oh Father, I see that you have carried me through. I see that the hand of grace that was on each of us, Lord, and your promise is that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will journey us together. The Lord who started the ministry, the Lord who started the church in each of us. I see that the Lord is saying that he is faithful enough to strengthen us and to lead us and guide us. Do not be worried about your leadership skills within you. The Lord who is in you will lead you. The Lord who was with jo Moses is the same Lord who is with each of us. Despite your weaknesses, be strengthened, be strong, be courageous. The, the God who gave promise to Joshua is revealing to each one of us, saying that, be courageous, be strong. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And today the Lord is speaking to each one of us here in the class and who are listening to us even through e-learning platform. God is saying, I'm strengthening you. I'm leading you. As I was with my servant, so am I now. I am the God who is Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Lord who chose you. I have called you. And I will teach you. And I will lead you. You are not alone in this journey. Don't look at your weakness. Because I am the great God, the God of all wisdom. The source of all wisdom is within you. The scripture says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge. Look up to God, the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And here God is saying, be bold, be fearless. If I could do great and mighty things to the simple disciples like Peter, James, John, who were the fishermen. They didn't have any knowledge. The same God is saying, I will give you the courage and I will give you the boldness. And when you stand in my presence and speak, it is me who speaks in and through you. And this is the promise that God is giving each of us that we will be the mouthpiece of God. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We receive it, Lord. We receive your love. We receive your grace. We receive who you are in us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. 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 And thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. And this has been our last session. And thank you. May God bless each one of you and enrich you and fill you with more of his grace, more of his power, more of his wisdom to lead us in the place where God has called us. I've taken extra time. Thank you so much for staying and God bless. And yes, I will create the assignment and I'll post it. Request you all to please upload the summary of each and every book. Write it in your own words, either in Word document or PPT and post it. And these assignments are only for the online students. For the e-learning, it is different. We will put it on the e-learning platform. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for being a blessing. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you and God bless you, Pastor Dan. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yes, thank you. God bless.